Hello everyone, uh, this is Jeff with Mississippi in the Civil War. Welcome to part six of Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags, the regimental history of the 38th Mississippi Infantry. If you haven't watched uh, the other five parts, I would highly recommend uh, doing uh, those in order as I am telling a chronological uh, story of the history of the regiment from its beginnings in 1862 through the end of the war in 1865. And if you do enjoy this episode, uh, if you give it a like, and if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do, because it's really the only way I have to gauge uh, interest in, in my content and, and deciding whether I, I will do more of these. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, we're going to be beginning here with uh, the movement of the 38th Mississippi and their brigade from around Yazoo City up to North Mississippi. And... Uh, the, when we ended the last episode, uh, Colonel H.P. Mabry, the commander of the brigade that the 38th Mississippi belonged to, had just received orders uh, sending him up to North Mississippi because there was a big battle brewing. And the 38th Mississippi arrived with their brigade in Okalona on June 13, 1864, and were assigned to the army commanded by the Confederate Wizard of the Saddle, uh, Major General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And they arrived just as the general was completing one of his greatest victories, uh, the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, which was uh, June 10, 1864. And uh, you have to say, confidence in their new general was extremely high among the members of the 38th Mississippi. In fact, uh, one of them, Erastus Hoskins, wrote his wife and said, Our men are all anxious to get in one fight under Forrest. And uh, having missed the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, uh, Mabry's brigade remained at Okalona until the end of June, when they were all ordered to uh, Saltillo, uh, Mississippi. And Forrest's victory at Bryce's Crossroads had a very strong impact on the Union strategy and would lead immediately to the 38th's first fight uh, in their new command. At this time, General William T. Sherman was engaged in his Georgia campaign, uh, his army was supplied by the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, and if Nathan Bedford Forrest could cut this vital lifeline, uh, the Union Army's advance in Georgia might just grind to a halt. And of course, Sherman was very anxious to make sure this did not happen. So after Bryce's Crossroads, the threat from Forrest uh, was very real, and uh, Sherman resolved to deal with the problem once and for all. On June 16, 1864, the fiery general issued the following order to Major General James B. McPherson, uh, commander of the Department of Tennessee. And he told him, I wish you to organize as large a force as possible at Memphis with Generals A.J. Smith or Moore in command to pursue Forrest on foot, devastating the land over which he has passed or may pass, and make him and the people of Tennessee and Mississippi realize that although a bold, daring, and successful leader he will bring ruin and misery on any country where he may pause or tarry. If we do not punish Forrest and the people now, the whole effect of our past conquests will be lost. So with that very dire message in hand, uh, the Union Command got the ball rolling. Command of the expedition to destroy Forrest was given to Major General Andrew J. Smith. And on July 5, 1864, he led a force of 14,000 men and 24 cannon out of, of LaGrange, Tennessee, headed south into Mississippi to combat the expedition. Uh, Forrest had an army of about 7,500 cavalry, 2,100 dismounted cavalry serving as infantry, and about 20 cannon. In response to the Federal advance, Mabry's brigade was moved forward from Saltillo to Ellistown, <coughs> 15 miles northwest of Tupelo, on July 9th. On arrival, the brigade was temporarily attached to Brigadier General Abraham Buford's division for the coming battle. Just before the 38th Mississippi left Ellistown, Major Robert C. McKay, who was commanding the 38th Mississippi, penned one last hasty letter to his wife Elizabeth, and he is speculating on where the regiment was heading. He told her, quote, I dropped you a line to say we are sending everything to the rear except what we can carry on horseback, and suppose by tomorrow we will be on our way to Sherman's rear or else to Tennessee. We are certainly doing, going this time to do something. 
what this distant future will have to reveal. God grant that we will meet with success and all return safe. I go to do my duty, and if we fight, we'll try to make a name for my command. And that uh, was prophetic because he would certainly do that. At this point in the campaign, it appeared that the Union column was headed for Oklahoma, and in anticipation of this move, the 38th, along with the rest of Buford's division, was ordered to Pontotoc as a blocking force. Uh, the weary rebels arrived in town the morning of July 10th after an exhausting all-night ride to get there. That same day, uh, Stephen D. Lee, the department commander, and General Forrest, the army commander, set up a joint headquarters at Oklahoma. Lee being the senior officer present, he assumed overall command of the expedition against the Federals. And when he arrived in Pontotoc, General Buford was ordered uh, to position his men so that they were in front of and on the flank of the approaching Yankee column. He placed his men, including the 38th Mississippi, five miles south of Pontotoc on the Pontotoc Road. And his order stated that he was to offer a stern resistance to the Union advance and only retreat back to Oklahoma if compelled by a superior force. On July 11th, the Yankees marched into Pontotoc, driving out the advance pickets of Buford's brigade. The next day, the Union soldiers marched out of town, heading straight for the Confederate defensive line south of Pontotoc. Heavy skirmishing took place as the rebels contested the Yankee advance, but the 38th was held in reserve and took no part in this fighting. On July 13th, General Smith abruptly changed his line of march and moved off to the east toward Tupelo. Uh, this move came as quite a surprise to both Lee and Forrest, who had been planning to fight uh, the decisive battle against Smith on ground of their own choosing near Oklahoma. And as the Federals moved rapidly towards Tupelo, Mabry's brigade, with Forrest at its head, pressed the rear guard of the retreating Yankee army. As the uh, Federals passed through Pontotoc, uh, Forrest ordered Mabry to force his way into the town. The colonel led his men into a furious charge in, in, into the town, pushing aside the 7th Kansas Cavalry and Company A of the 61st United States Colored, Cavalry, or Colored Infantry. Private F.H. Holloway of the Brent Rifles, Company K of the 38th Mississippi, uh, wrote in an account for Confederate Veteran Magazine of this action, and he said, I should like to hear from any old soldier who was with Maybridge Brigade, Forest Command in July 1864 at Pontotoc, Mississippi, when the Yankees began to fall back. Do you remember how the ladies shouted and waved their handkerchiefs at seeing the boys in gray after them? How we scoured the thickets for the Yanks, and how they would fire a volley and run. So the 38th uh, continued the pursuit of the retreating Federals, fighting numerous skirmishes throughout the day as the Union column pushed on toward Tupelo. The chase continued about, until about 2 a.m. on July 14th, when the rebel horse soldiers finally pulled up uh, their sweat-soaked mounts one mile outside of Harrisburg, a small hamlet uh, that was two miles west of Tupelo. There the rebels found the Federal Army drawn up in line of battle, waiting to receive an attack. And although the Confederates were outnumbered and facing a determined enemy, General Stephen D. Lee felt that he had no choice but to attack. He later explains his decision to engage the Federals at Harrisburg by saying, quote, All the armies of the Confederacy were facing superior numbers and resources, and everywhere Confederate armies at this stage of the war had to fight against great odds or not fight at all. On this occasion, not to fight would have been to have given up the great corn region of Mississippi, the main support of other armies facing the enemy on more important fields. So the, the decision was made, the die was cast, the Confederates were going to attack, even though the Federals had a very a strong position and uh, were not going to be moved out of it easily. Uh, the Union line of battle, uh, which ran a mile and a half long, uh, was along the crest of a ridge which gave them an excellent view of the surrounding landscape. From the crest of the ridge, the land sloped gently downward to a wood line several hundred yards away. Uh, to reach the Federals, Mabry's men were going to have to advance uphill and cross several hundred yards of open ground while exposed to artillery and small arms fire. Uh, to make matters worse, the Rebels were going to have to make their assault under a blistering Mississippi summer sun 
and heat exhaustion was going to take a very large toll on the attacking uh, Confederates. So preparing to attack, General Lee took personal command of uh, the left wing of the army, uh, which would attack the right and center of the federal line. General Forrest took command of the right wing of the army, and he was ordered to swing his men around uh, the Union left and attack their vulnerable flank. Uh, the 38th Mississippi dismounted from their horses and deployed with Maybridge Brigade on the extreme Confederate left and prepared to advance just after 8 a.m. Uh, General Lee gave the order to attack, and with Major McKay at their head, the regiment uh, pressed forward toward the Union line. And according to General Lee's plan, the left wing under his command was to attack first, strike the Federal right a sharp blow, and keep their attention on that section of the battlefield. Uh, once the Rebel left was heavily engaged, Forrest was then to smash the, the Federal right, left flank. And uh, this plan went awry right from the start. Uh, the brigades of Lee's left wing uh, failed to coordinate their movements. Uh, they attacked piecemeal, allowing the Federals to concentrate their fire on each individual brigade and shred it uh, as each unit attacked. And as the 38th Mississippi uh, cleared the woods and moved into the open, uh, they were almost immediately targeted by uh, federal artillery. Uh, iron shot and shell began to tear holes in their line. Uh, the Mississippians dressed ranks and continued across this wide open killing field which separated them from the Yankees. When they were within 300 yards of the Union line, uh, a terrific fire from the Union infantry uh, opened up on them as well but the 38th Mississippi continued to press forward uh, through this hellstorm of lead. Uh, Major McKay uh, was at the forefront of his regiment, urging them forward uh, when he was struck in the head by, an, by a uh, bullet, uh, died immediately in the arms of Colonel Mabry. Uh, he was dead before he hit the ground. In his after action report, uh, Colonel Mabry gave a very vivid account of the charge that killed so many of the men in his brigade. He said, quote, I immediately ordered a charge, but the heat was so intense and the distance so great that some of the men and officers fell exhausted and fainting along my line, while the fire from the enemy's line of works by both artillery and small arms was so heavy and well directed that many were killed and wounded. These two causes of depletion left my line almost like a line of skirmishers. But uh, despite these heavy casualties and the loss of their, their regimental commander, the 38th Mississippi pressed on, uh, leaving just a trail of uh, gray-clad bodies that, that marked the, the line of their advance. When they got to about 60 yards from the Union line, uh, the fire was so intense that the survivors just had to take uh, shelter in a small depression that gave them a little bit of protection from uh, just a hurricane of fire being thrown at them. Uh, the men quickly uh, loaded and fired at the Union line, uh, and those that made it to the relative safety of the Depression found themselves under the command of Captain John J. Green of Company F, uh, who was the only company commander still with the regiment. Uh, Mabry eventually gave Green the order uh, to take his men and advance on the Union line to try and cover that last 60 yards, but uh, the young uh, captain bluntly told his brigade commander Colonel, we have exhausted every round of ammunition, but if you say so, we will try again with empty guns. And on hearing these words, Mabry replied, we can't stay here and live, order your men back. And with that order, uh, the, the uh, attack ended. The heavy fire, however, did not immediately let uh, the survivors of Mabry's brigade uh, withdraw. It was just, it would have been death to try and leave the little depression they were in. So uh, while, they, uh, while they were stuck in that depression, the next brigade in line, that, the Tennessee Brigade of Colonel Tyree H. Bell advanced on their right, and the Yankees switched their fire to this new threat. Uh, when the musket fire and artillery slackened on their position, the 38th with their brigade retreated out of the range of the Union guns, and the day's survivors uh, took stock of the calamity that had befallen them. Uh, the regiment was smashed and took no further part in the battle. The other units in Lee's uh, left wing suffered the same fate as uh, Mabry's brigade. 
Uh, their piecemeal attacks were all easily repulsed with extremely heavy losses. Uh, when General Forrest saw the fearful destruction done to the left wing, he called off his attack on the right by the, for the, it was slated to begin uh, uh, by the men in his command. Uh, the Confederates then prepared themselves for a Union counterattack, but uh, uh, Union General uh, A.J. Smith had uh, thought his exhausted men had seen enough action for one day and did not elect to continue the contest. The next day, on July 15th, with his men low on ammunition and food, uh, the federal commander decided to return to Memphis. Uh, General Lee initially followed the, the retreating Federals, but owing to the thoroughly worn out condition of his men and the heavy casualties they had taken, uh, he called off the pursuit on July 16th. The charge at Harrisburg, I have to say, was clearly the high watermark of the 38th Mississippi service. Outnumbered and outgunned, the rank and file of the regiment uh, pressed home their attack with great valor despite that, the extremely heavy casualties. Uh, for their bravery, uh, the men paid a very heavy price. There were 20 men killed, 51 wounded, and three missing uh, for a total casualty list of 74. Uh, an examination of the dead and wounded uh, shows the 38th Mississippi's officers paid an extremely high price at Harrisburg. Uh, included among the killed uh, were the commanding officer, Robert Kay, and nine of his uh, company commanders were also wounded. Ca in fact, Captain John J. Green was the only company commander in the regiment to come out of the fight unwounded. Or so the command structure of the regiment had been decimated in just a matter of, of an hour or so. And shortly after the battle, Erastus Hoskins of Company A wrote his wife and gave her a detailed account of the battle. He told her, quote, the enemy threw up works of rails and logs and early in the morning of the 14th, our forces advanced and the battle raged in earnest. Our boys say it was the hottest place they had ever been in. Our regiment lost very heavily. It went into the fight with 158 men and lost 13 killed and 57 wounded and 10 missing in all 74, which is more than any other regiment. It went farther than any other in the charge and remained longer. Colonel Mabry says never was a more gallant charge made than the one made by the 38th. Major McKay acted gallantly and was shot in the head and fell dead in the field. Adjutant W.L. Ware was mortally wounded in the breast, uh, but, nine, uh, uh, but of nine officers commanding companies, one was killed and seven wounded, a severe blow to the 38th. I don't think we gained anything by the fight it might be termed a draw battle. I think the loss on both sides about the same. And while the enemy could not advance south, we could not advance on them. The enemy finally retreated, leaving us in possession of the field, which makes us the victors, though dearly paid for. And he was exactly right. This was the kind of victory that the Confederates simply could not uh, uh, take at this stage of the war. They really accomplished nothing. In fact, uh, the Federals accomplished their goal. Uh, Forrest was never able to uh, concentrate and attack uh, Sherman's uh, supply lines. So uh, it was really a, a Federal strategic victory. But uh, the 38th had, uh, had made quite a name for themselves in this charge, and they, they would look back on pride at this moment in later years, although they, they deeply mourned their, their heavy losses in this battle. And uh, that's going to end this episode. In uh, part seven, uh, I'm going to bring uh, the, this to a close with the, the final, uh, final battles uh, that the 38th Mississippi took place, uh, that they, they, took, they participated in. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll come back and see that last episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please give it a like and a thumbs up. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again very soon.